This is going to be my notes and reflections on the first chapter of the first section of Bernd Heinrich's um, Life Everlasting. Um, this is a book about the relationship between life and death, and uh, by one of my favorite naturalist writers. Um, this is a spoiler alert right now. I am going to spoil um, the chapter that I'm about to talk about in this video. If you haven't read the book and you think you're going to read the book, um, don't watch my video until you've read that chapter if you don't want it spoiled for you. Um, if you have read it and you want to compare notes, uh, check out my video. If you don't think you're going to read it and you want to hear what that chapter's about, check out my video. You know, whatever. But I just want to let put that out there up front that I'm going to go into some detail um, about what's going on in this chapter. And this chapter is called um, Beetles That Bury Mice. And it is about um, the uh, necrophorus beetles, or necrophorus beetles, but it should be necro, um, <clears throat> which basically means the death-loving beetles. They're also called burying beetles, or also called sexton beetles, um, and there's several species in the northern hemispheres um, that are they're fairly common and basically the knowledge about these beetles that was that was there um, that is there today is that um, well they are very very kind of um, complex species um, in many ways more complex than you would think for an insect for instance um, what they will do um, is they might find a small uh, recently deceased mouse and um, a male will land on that mouse and um, kind of like stand on his head and emit a pheromone out of his back end that will attract a woman. She'll come there, see that he's got a, um, a recently dead mouse and they will mate. And um, they're supposedly monogamous, although what Byrne finds out in this chapter is that's not quite the case. But anyway, they will mate on this mouse, or they will mate, and then um, they will move underneath the mouse and work together to shuffle the mouse off, lying on their backs and using their feet to push the mouse to move it along to an area where an area of ground where they're going to be able to the ground is loose enough to bury it if it's loose enough right on the spot they might do it right on the spot but if they have to move it that's how they'll move it they'll lie on their backs and, and use their legs and shuffle the mouse to another location um can't be too far um but but they will move it um so they move it to the location and then they kind of trench it in basically they dig it they dig from underneath it they dig dirt out and sink the mouse into a hole and um, and then uh, deposit eggs um, on the mouse and um, the larvae hatch and the um, female sticks around uh, to feed the larvae and she feeds them by mouth like a, like a mama bird to a baby bird feeds them by mouth bits of the mice um, until they're big enough to trench into the mouse itself and eat away at it um, and when they've eaten enough they're matured um, they leave the mouse carcass go into the earth and perhaps hibernate until the next spring um, pupating and merging as new uh, necrophorus beetles and so this is the this is their life cycle process they're supposedly monogamous um, they do all of this stuff the mother stays back and take nurtures the young um, the male might go out and start another relationship. Um, and what what Byrne does in this chapter is he basically experiments with him. And this is what I love about Byrne Heinrich. And this is what, you know, this chapter really reminded me of with him is his real, uh, um, it, his understanding of how to conduct very simple what should be obvious um, experiments right in a natural setting um, and the things that you can learn from the patience of observing 
um, in those experiments. For instance, he himself takes different mice um, and voles and such and shrews and offers them out to the beetles and will watch for a few hours and see what becomes of those uh, mice. And then even more than a few hours, if they if they happen to be taken away by uh, necrophorus beetles and, and buried, um, he may, after a, after a period of time, come back and unbury them to see what the advancement has been and this kind of thing. And what he learns from this process of, of, uh, watch, of observing um, what happens with his own offerings of dead rodents and such um, <clears throat> is some interesting things. Uh, for one, if it's not recently enough dead, um, the beetles will still be attracted to it, uh, but they might have almost like, they might just use it as a place to um, uh, to copulate, um, but they don't actually try to lay their eggs there. A uh, male might find the carcass, he might let out the pheromone, it, it invites a female, other beetles show up, other males might sneak a copulation with that female, she might have several of those males. Um, and then she might move off to some other carcass that's not uh, that's more fresh, and lay her eggs there. Um, it gets quite a bit more complex than what is traditionally in the literature about these um, about these uh, beetles. He also recognizes that um, there's a particular like orange and black striped beetle um, that when it flies it looks yellow, and he's wondering how the heck this happens. And what uh, he eventually learns through observation is that when they um, when they pull their wings out, they invert uh, their wing covers, and on the underside of their wing covers is yellow. And so when they fly, they look like bumblebees, and but when they uh, land and they close their wings, then they look like necrophorous beetles again. Um, so all of this stuff he learns through just like patient observation, but um, but he's able to um, uh, make these, compel these events to happen by making offerings of dead mice and things like this. Uh, so, you know, what I get from it, for one thing, is I, I know I've seen some of these beetles before. I think I even videotaped uh, not too uh, long ago at the pond. I found a dead turtle and turned it over, and there was one of these yellow and black necrophorous beetles. Um, so they are here, and but I don't, I haven't given them the kind of careful uh, attention or tried to even learn about them in the way that Bern Heinrich is, and this is what makes the difference between a really awesome expert naturalist and myself. And this is what I really get when I read Bern Heinrich's uh, works, is that it kind of inspires me to 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 utilize techniques to be a better naturalist than I am, I, I, I kind of become like a lazy naturalist, uh, whereas he is constantly experimenting and learning things, and he's learning things that aren't in the literature, and this is what makes him, um, you know, this is what's made his career, because he is a professional biologist, and he's able to publish on these things that he learns. Um, from experiments that are not in a laboratory, but out in the field, out in his land in Maine, um, where he loves to spend time. And there's so much going on in that ecology. There's an endless supply of things to learn from. And this is the problem, um, is that you can walk out into a natural area, and if you don't have an inquisitive mind like that of Bern Heinrich, then you don't ask questions. And when you don't ask questions, you don't, f you don't learn. And this is what I get from him. Um, certainly, he has taught me something about this ne about these necrophorous beetles, where I'm going to be paying more attention to them. But he's also taught me something about, or reminded me about, um, incorporating better methodology into my learning. And so that's what I appreciate, and that's what I get from this chapter. Um, and I will continue reading from there. Yeah, I just remembered a couple more notes that I wanted to say about the Bern Heinrich chapter um, that I just wanted to log because these are going to be my study notes for the future. But um, these necrophorous beetles, um, 
they also have some mites on them that hide underneath their wing covers and uh, these mites um, when the beetle lands on a dead mouse or something like that the um, the mites will come off and uh, quickly um, scour the mouse and eat any uh, eggs from like blue bottle and green bottle flies these kind of things if the flies have come and laid eggs that are going to turn into maggots these mites will go ahead and eat all of those um, and then return to the beetle and so um, this is how they're able to utilize the carcass without um, the flies uh, putting maggots onto them and, and, uh, and utilizing the carcass themselves for their own for their own um, broods and you know of course it is also uh, worth noting that is an example of how these species have to have um, death in order to bring in the new life of their species but this is the truth with all pretty much all of life um, in one way or another.